What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hepness, and it is my mission to help you to make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Thomas Lahnthaler, and we talk about facilitation when we take away our most powerful tool, which is not the sticky note, but the question. And if you don't have your pen and paper next to you, because you're walking, you're in the gym or commuting, then why don't you visit my webpage to download the one-page summary that I made just for you. So visit www.workshops.work, find episode with Thomas Lahnthaler and download the one-page summary. So stay tuned and first enjoy the show. Good morning, Thomas. Good morning, Miriam. And welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. We are going to speak about workshop facilitation without our favorite and most powerful tool, which yes. is not a sticky note, but the question. It's the questions. Exactly. Yeah, no, it's going to be exciting to see what we get. I was thinking for a moment whether I want to impose the challenge upon me to guide you and the audience through this podcast episode without asking questions. And then I was like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, that might have been an interesting experience for a podcast, yeah, because it's set up on asking questions, but uh, we can try it another time, maybe. Yes, maybe we should do a workshop about that. But before we talk about these kind of things, I would be very curious to hear your story because you were born in Austria now you live in Norway and in the meantime you worked in Afghanistan and in Africa and in Latin America no uh, not in Latin America but Asia Asia yeah. as a development agent in conflict <laughs> management so how did you get from solving conflicts on the ground to solving conflicts in meeting rooms? Wow, how much time do you have? No, I, um, I think you summed it up very well. I actually just realized that I have not lived in Austria almost as long as I lived there before. No, I left Austria, well, what is it now, 15, 16, 20 years ago, about that, to really start a journey which turned out to be just a privilege. I mean, I... I I went into conflict zones. Uh, I was always fascinated by conflict work. Basically, it's not so much about solving conflict for me. It's really about dealing with them and transforming them into opportunities and chances. But what was interesting when I started this work, and this was as a volunteer in South Africa a long time ago, I realized that everything I'd learned, everything I'd studied, that didn't make any sense. I, know, I knew nothing about conflict because I met people who had actually lived with it not me coming from Austria, mm. which is now a, a, a fairly peaceful place. So uh, in South Africa, that was different. So I, I understood that this was really a learning journey for me. And um, it led me to many countries. I met fascinating people. I learned so much. And what I tried to do in my role was basically just to simply give them different perspectives. Mm. As much as they gave me perspectives, I tried to give them perspectives in the sense of how you could also look at conflict in a different way. Because in many of those countries, conflict is, is so deeply indoctrinated in the culture. I have, I have colleagues, I have friends who work with the fascinating topic of collective trauma, mm -hmm. for example, which is passed on over generations, right? And it was challenging to, to sometimes come in with perspectives because, of course, you have limitations, you have cultural boundaries, you have language boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. uh, things mean different things in different places. And I hope I contributed a little bit here and there. And I think what it also taught me is every time I came back from places like this, I saw that it's as much needed to get new perspectives here. And it's not necessarily always important to travel all over the world to do this because you can as much contribute back home. And that work, of course, and living in places like this is also mental draining, right? It's, it's um, if, if you're like me and many people are, that you really go in 120% in those situations and being quite young, you're not really aware of, of where your limits are. You think you can work limitless and, and endless mm -hmm. hours and you're mentally drained you only realize when you come out so all of that led to me plus getting a bit older 
being like, yeah, let's settle somewhere else. And um, still here and there, work in places like or crisis and conflict zones. But but uh, yeah, let's support people here and give them perspectives here and take back from what I've seen out there into the classrooms here. It might be difficult to put it into a nutshell, but what is the key learning that you aim to bring into the classroom or into the meeting room from there? It is difficult to put in a nutshell, but I would simply take that there is no one truth. Mm -hmm. And it's all about sharing perspectives. It's really about understanding that you see things differently than I do. Mm -hmm. Even though I might assume we come from very culturally similar background, we, we might assume we, when we talk about things, we understand completely the same thing. Mm -hmm. So this is always exciting to work with participants in workshops to make them understand and, and realize that, wow, sometimes it's not even the same thing we're talking about because we interpret it different. We have mm -hmm. different stories connected to certain terms, to certain, yeah, to certain situations that influence mm -hmm. us and our perspectives on it. And obviously it sounds very easy. Okay, just open your mind and see the other perspective and then we can all be friends. But when it comes to a topic that is emotional, where we have feelings maybe over generations of trauma attached, it's difficult to really listen to the words of the other person. So we might listen to the words, but we don't hear the meanings and we're not open for this acceptance of different perspectives. So how do you get your participants into this mindset or even psychological safety to really be able to open up and to hear the words or to hear the meaning behind the words? I mean, first, what you've said is, of course, a key because conflicts very often, and I think we're not so good at that in our parts of the world, hardly ever play out on, on what is the conflict topic. Mm -hmm. So we might debate about something very factual. Well, what really the conflict issue is, is a couple of levels slower than that. So I think it's, it's important. Emotions, feelings are important. And the first step is really to make people understand that it's okay. It's also okay to be angry. Mm -hmm. I've worked with many people that try to limit themselves when they're really angry. And I'm like, well, let it out for a start and then see how it feels, and then we can move on. And people are usually surprised what happens then. Mm -hmm. But psychological safety and safety is, of course, an, an interesting thing, and, and it's, it's very tricky to facilitate because you, most of the time you don't know the people. So you really start from scratch. But what we like to do and, uh, is to catch them a little bit by surprise because everybody mm -hmm. comes in with expectations. They've done workshops before. They have had their experiences. They know what's going to happen. But we like to catch them by surprise that they don't get the chance to sit down calmly, but immediately are ex expected to do something or have to do a task that they might not be prepared for and then reflect over it. Because what mm -hmm. happens then is that you, I found curiosity and attention quite good catalysts for safety mm -hmm. because you distract them a little bit from, from the black box they come in with. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is the reflection, of course. That's where you pick them up, where you say like, well, you know, come in, tell me how this was for you and uh, share connect and for me a very important thing is that I'm usually at the beginning part of this I'm not detaching myself being like okay I'm just here to facilitate this and, and I have an external role but I'm I'm part of this I also put myself out there put mm -hmm. myself out and outside the comfort zone just to see that you're not alone in this I'm also going to do this so we're in it together which usually works and finally I think what I found interesting is we talk a lot about psychological safety but also maybe having worked in places where I've worked for me it's very often connected also to physical safety. Mm. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how we set up the classroom. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, in one case, we spent an hour and a half because it was, we really, we wanted to create this safety, but, but it does something if you haven't got the right setting, if you have distance, physical distance, boundaries between you and, and the participants, for example, or between them themselves. Mm -hmm. So we hate to work with tables, right? Yes. So it's this physical safety that strongly plays into the psychological from our experience. True, because it's also how we perceive the room. The room can have so much power as such just with the furniture it has or the flexibility it allows, sunlight it gives. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and we, we, we like to set up the room already that, it's, that people are already caught by surprise when they come in. Yeah. So it's not a traditional setup, but it's already set up like either in just maybe two chairs opposite each other so that they haven't mm -hmm. really choice other than already get in a situation where they're, where they're like taken a little bit slightly out of their comfort yeah. zone. In 
And just to place the chairs in a circle is so powerful. I mean, there's a good reason why we've been doing this for over so many years, sitting around the campfire, in church, exactly. in sects, exactly. Alcoholics Anonymous, yeah, all sit in circles. <laughs> and you s said before that you allow or you give the participants permission to let their emotions out. So it's okay to be angry. Yes. And I see a challenge there because we are so used to suppress our feelings and emotions in the daily environment. When we go to work, we are not supposed to show that we are angry and to shout at our coworkers. So how do you make sure that they feel at ease and that they hear the permission? And what is the impact then of letting these emotions out? Rather than a permission, I would, I would call it an invitation and simply, in a way, allowing space for them to articulate things that they would like to articulate in, in the immediate way. Mm -hmm. right? So not, I've learned over many years that it's actually quite a powerful tool to, and it's a fine line, of course, uh, to, to be able to deal with a certain level of tension mm -hmm. in the room. So it's not necessarily always uh, beneficial if you stop it and say like, well, let's take a break because this is too much. Yes, eventually you can do that. But if you let that heat up a bit, people might afterwards be a bit deflated in their, in their tension. Mm -hmm. This is what we've seen. So if people are allowed to, to express their anger, to, their emotions, their frustrations, they should have a space for that. And mm -hmm. once it's out, once they've been seen, once they had a chance to articulate that, and that's really important for them, then they're more open to cooperate and interested in what others have to say and are mm -hmm. often surprised on, on the reactions and, and that there might be really an understanding even for that. So, I mean, it's, it's a fine line. It's a fine mm -hmm. balance. You know that very well from your own work that, of course, you have to read a little bit the group and, and see how it's going. But in general, I found it quite beneficial to at least to a certain extent let these emotions go. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not speaking about shouting at each other limitless. I'm really speaking about just when you see there's frustration that you find a space, maybe a creative way. You know, mm -hmm. there's... The, There's these exercises where you can write them to balloons and then you pop the balloons and it's, it's mm. just a, a visual aid of, you know, let the frustration out and make it disappear in a way. And then we can move on to something constructive. I was about to ask whether you debrief on the emotions once they've been expressed. And then I wondered that depending on the exercise you choose, you might not even need a debrief, which is maybe even better because... I encounter this weird situation when someone expresses his or her emotions and then you have the silence and nobody really knows how to deal with it. And every word seems kind of inappropriate and you don't want to make it an academic case either because that's embarrassing for everyone who's in the room. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> We are debriefing, but we are not necessarily calling it debrief. We call it reflection, but it's really often also, sometimes it's guided, sometimes it's individual, sometimes it's just an invitation. But it's, it's, it's more about really uh, taking a step back, zooming maybe out and see like what has happened. But mm -hmm. as you say, of course, there are situations when this is absolutely not necessary. When you feel like everybody's in a way in a good place or everybody has enough to think about, mm -hmm. but already not too much. So you're not necessarily in a position where you have to pick them up somewhere, but you, you send them home, give them a little homework to think about. And then it's, of course, not necessary. But mm -hmm. of course, again, you have to read the group and, and, and familiarize yourself with the dynamics, with the characters, with what's going on in the day, your own role, not least. Mm -hmm. So how do you fit into the picture? Because sometimes you can over-reflect. We've also mm -hmm. had that. It's like a bit too much reflection now and we've gotten the feedback like, okay, can we do something because we're only reflecting all the time. So it's a balance and it's really yeah. depending on the group you have in front of you. Yeah, especially whether this reaction also triggers something in yourself and then to be self-aware enough to see, okay, that's all about me. It has nothing to do with the group and then to step back and um, get the focus back on the group. When I phrased the question asked for regarding the permission that you give, you immediately said it's rather an invitation. And I hear this very often mm -hmm. that facilitators invite the group instead of giving them permission or telling them what to do. Where do you see the difference between permission and invitation 
because for me it sounds like a push and a pull kind of thing but i wonder what you what your intention is with speaking out an invitation instead of a permission well the interesting thing is that permission is probably exactly a word that we might interpret differently in my reading of permission is very authoritative it's very i'm allowing you to do something while you probably read it completely different I think, and this was also a bit of a learning process, I think, uh, and I've seen particularly young facilitators and training trainers maybe not being aware so much of, of the power and the authority a facilitator has by nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this is very important to regularly reflect over because it's a power that we should be very careful with because mm -hmm. we can guide a group. But after all, it's, it's, it's really primarily about the group. So if we impose ourselves too much, with rules and regulations and this is how we do it and then we might miss the purpose we might not i think it's it's really again situation dependent what i to your question what i see as a difference well an invitation in a way can be many things for me it can be simply triggering maybe the will to speak it's not always phrasing it so open like yeah if you want to share share but almost provoke them a little bit with my observations or my statements in the sense of in a safe way Mm -hmm. I don't know if this makes sense, so, but, but really like saying like I've observed or I've, I've, I've heard this comment when mm -hmm. you did this exercise and then I read out the quote without saying who it was and then it's uh, what, what's in your mind when you hear, about, when you hear that mm -hmm. quote and it's, it's very often of course the person who said it and realizes it that, that responds but not always. Some people are like, oh, I didn't, I didn't even think about it that way. And, and you, you basically create a way of sharing and of course we say in the beginning of our workshops we will take you out of the comfort zone but we, I mean, we're with you, but we will still be out of the comfort zone, but you don't have to. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, if you don't feel comfortable, it's okay. Say it, because this should, should still be an experience for you where you're with us and not kind of tune out after half an hour. Okay, so an, an invitation is rather the way of creating space in which the participants may take the opportunity to do something. Yes, of course, stimulate it. Of yeah. course, provoke. Um, yeah. And usually from our experience, that's enough. Mm -hmm. And you said silence before. For example, silence is, an, is a perfect invitation, but it's also a perfect provocation because we have the natural tendency to feel silence with, mm -hmm. with sounds because we feel many people feel uncomfortable with silence and it's an absolute powerful tool mm -hmm. if you as a facilitator, but also if you as any other as a mediator, for example, can sit through silence. And it seems like you've sat there for five minutes, but if you look at the watch, it probably was 20 seconds. So I, this is also, it's an invitation, but it's, it's of course a bit more than that because we, we sometimes as facilitators are very aware of what we're doing, right? Mm. So. Yeah, it sounds almost like a rhetoric question, this invitation. It's your, yes. You're preparing everything so that they unconsciously have to do it. That they want to join the party, so to say. Yeah. But still, you're not forcing them. And I think this is maybe for me how I understand now from what you're saying, the concept of invitation is the awareness of the facilitator that you cannot force any of the participants to do anything. You can only create the environments and speak out explicitly or implicitly the invitation for them to join you in the journey. And I think to add one element to that, it's also about using the other parts of the group, right? Mm -hmm. So using the dynamics within the group. Because when we work, we very often do not want to be the centerpiece of the whole facilitation. So when there's critical questions, critical comments, it's very easy to bounce it off into the rest of the group because it, it creates its own dynamic that the group starts to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more uncomfortable for me when I ask a question or, or we, we talk about a reflection and people only talk to me. So of course I walk through the room, I stand behind other people. So I, I, I really try these, all these facilitation tools to make them just change the direction of their talking about. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I just also bounce it back. I was like, is there other opinions? So it's just simply distract them. Yeah. So, and these dynamics also are invitation that are done by the group themselves. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not only I who invent, Uh, spaces to invent tools to invite them but it's also the group dynamic that can be used your example really speaks to me and it happens so often that yeah participants speak to us as facilitators instead of each other and i always wonder to what extent this reflects their daily communication patterns as well so would they rather speak to 
the authority of the group instead of to their peers? And does it also impact their listening? Would they also then rather listen to the person in front than to the people next to them? I think uh, many of those things might really be accurate that you just said, because of course it depends on the group and, uh, and the setting. But, but this is what I said initially when I talked about the facilitator's authority. I think this is very important to reflect over. Mm-hmm. And, and if you see that, depends again on the topic, but if you see that you become, in a way, you, you almost enter dialogue with the group, mm-hmm. the group is one and you is one, then you should rethink a little bit the approach because if uh, the group needs to, to connect, they need to talk to each other. So it's important to regularly reflect over your own role, I mm-hmm. think. Yeah, at the end of the day, we're there for them. <laughs> exactly. That's our only role. In a couple of times now, you mentioned that one strategy is to play the ball back to them. So to bounce the question back to them or to ask them the question. So what if we would take away this tool of questioning? And maybe even before that, why would we? What is the beauty? And I'm asking this question, obviously, because we had um, extensive uh, briefing calls (laughs) before this recording. And you shared one experience you had in Australia with the Aborigines. And that inspired you of this technique of not asking questions. So maybe you can give us a little bit of context and then explain why would we not ask questions? Why would we not ask questions? Because it's incredibly empowering. But before I get to that, yeah, my my story, I mean, this is my life-changing story, I guess, in many, many ways. I found myself about now almost 10 years ago on a remote island north of Australia in a first people Aboriginal community that had um, opened up to one of their sacred rituals for non-Aborigines. It's a conflict resolution ritual that went over a couple of weeks and they had a cooperation with a university on really trying to create intercultural understanding, get closer together. And how, how did I end up there? Well, I guess that's just a lucky coincidence because I'm I, you mentioned before I'm from Austria and it's Australia and this, I, nobody knows why those words are so similar, but on my application, it turned out that they didn't read very carefully because when I ended up there, I saw that I was the only non-Australian there. I think that was as much a surprise for me as it was for them, but I took it for what it was and I think I gave them also my perspectives on, on things which were good. But we were when we came there to this already completely new context, we were basically just told there's only one rule in the mm-hmm. coming week. And that's no questions are allowed. And of course, you take that in as, yeah, sure, no questions are allowed. But they were very serious about this. So every time we had a lecture or every time we sat together and had a discussion or something, whenever somebody asked a question, it was just simply they were stopped in the middle of the questions and said, like, no questions allowed. Observe, listen, and learn. And what that led to was, I cannot even begin to describe the amount of frustrations that each of us felt after about two, three days because yeah. we came there to learn. We came there hungry for knowledge, for new experience. We were in this new context, like overwhelmed by impressions. And all we wanted to do is what we were taught since we were little. Like, if you don't understand something, ask. Mm-hmm. And you weren't allowed to. So really, people were talking about leaving again and they, what is this for? And, you know, nobody understood. Really, magic happened overnight. And I, I don't know how and I don't I have my own explanation which I'll give you in a second but it was fascinating to see that almost overnight we woke up like new people and what happened was that we stopped asking questions but we entered in a completely different dialogue with each other because Mm -hmm. what happened in my case and I, I got that confirmed from other people as well was that when you're so hungry for answers and knowledge and you have nowhere to turn to nobody can give you that you find them yourself Mm -hmm. You turn to yourself, look in the mirror, and you basically say like, okay, what do I actually think about it? Before being so quick with asking a question, what do I think about it? And it was incredibly empowering because you entered in a conversation where you started first with by simply sharing your realizations, Mm -hmm. your your thoughts, what had you found out about yourself, and what that triggered in the other person was to do the exact same thing, but without asking you anything. So. It was fascinating how it became this atmosphere of sharing perspectives. 
And to the second part of it, and not to make the story too long, what that led to was really like you became self-aware, you just focused on your own thing, you really picked up things very quickly, so you sharpened your other senses, and the ritual went on up to the point where we had to basically dance more or less naked in front of 500 people, a dance that we'd never danced, that we had to learn there on the spot for hours until it was synchronized. 50 people had to be synchronized. And it was only that first part that helped us not to think of, wow, I'm ridiculing myself so endlessly here Mm -hmm. because 500 people, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm half naked. But you were focused on yourself, you were focused on your task and you learned in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. And that sparked in a way the learning philosophy that we through groundwork want to apply, but also which led me to to the thing, well, what would be if we as facilitators and as people would not use any questions? Because I felt this so incredibly at the same time frustrating while also uplifting and really empowering because I am now way way more self aware of things I think, what I think about certain things and, and made me very reflective. And I think that was just uh, an amazing experience. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for listening. That's very inspiring. And I can only imagine the vulnerability you have to expose then to make the step to enter a dialogue without asking questions. Because questions is, as you also say, we, sometimes we hide behind questions or we are lazy to look into ourselves or we are lazy to explore ourselves. So it's easy to just ask the question, to throw the ball to someone else. I learned that actually from improv theater, that on stage you don't ask questions because this would mean that you put all the responsibility on your scene partner who has to come up spontaneously with an answer. So why don't you answer your own question? So your story reminds me a little bit of that. And you said many points now, which I think why, why this is such an interesting experience to try out because questions are also powerful too. Mm. Like whoever asks the question has the power in one way or the other because you basically, as you say, you pose the responsibility or you post the other one in the spotlight and or the group even. And um, what was so interesting, if you take it away, you have to rephrase the way of, you, of, your, own, of your own communication because you ha- by nature almost have to start with, an, with these I messages, mm-hmm. like what you think, what you feel, what you actually expect from this particular situation. And that is partly vulnerability. And it's, it's also self-clarification, which is, I think, mm-hmm. a key tool for us facilitators as well. And it's a connector because you, mm-hmm. you, I share something with me. So you might be more likely to and willing and without feeling under pressure to share something from you. Mm-hmm. So it's also some sort of invitation that we've talked about before. And, don't get me wrong. I, I use a lot of questions, right? It's clear. I also work yes, a lot yes. with questions. It's not that I don't ask any questions, but it's it's just having had this experience. I think it's, I saw, and I've tried it to some regard in, in, in some workshops, uh, not by giving the rule, no questions, but by simply not giving any answers. Mm. And it's almost the same effect because you see that, that things work, that people have question marks over their head, but they disappear after a couple mm. of days. They disappear. And even the feedback was a bit like, yeah, at the end they understood where we were going to because the process is tough. The mm-hmm. process is uncomfortable and it's not nice because you feel like you're left hanging. Mm-hmm. You feel like you're, you know, why am I doing this? There's no meaning. I don't understand. So yeah. It asks for a lot of self-control also for the facilitator because I imagine that it's very tempting to lean in and to explain or to give little hints but to stay strong, to say, no, I trust the process. I know that this is going to work. It's a lot of responsibility. It is the facilitator. It's the co-facilitators. I've done a similar approach. with. We've tried to explain this to my co-facilitators. We've, we've worked with a group for about three days. This was just the beginning of a longer course. We've worked with them for three days. And after a day and a half, I heard from pretty much all my co-facilitators like me. We have to give them something. They're, they're lost. I'm like, no, trust the process. It was a risk because I didn't know if it was going to work because I had that experience. It worked for me then and there, but um, it worked. And uh, on day three, as like as it was predicted, something happened and people changed because they, again, they felt the same frustration. They felt the same desperation. And you know, I need these. Mm-hmm. They were um, getting their own answers. 
thinking about it and we push them a little bit to just say like you have more answers than you know mm. and uh, you don't need to ask the questions because what we I, I think what we don't realize in is how many questions we're actually using facilitator mm. or not how often we ask questions is almost um, it's almost every second third statement is in one one or the other way a question and yeah. then also the most powerful tool is overused so I think it's just a way of communicating and really the, the way of connecting that that is. And I think you would be surprised how many questions can easily be rephrased mm. in, in statements and you get the same thing. Yes. What was the topic of this multi-day experience that you did for the participants? And I assume that it was a team. No, it wasn't a team. Oh. It was actually, well, yes and no. It was... Uh, It was people who who were in a way individuals in their roles, but they in one way or the other, when the crisis hit, they would go out into the field to the crisis situation and mm -hmm. then they would work as a team there. Okay. But they did not necessarily come as teams there. So mm -hmm. it was an interesting thing, but it was, it was a program that we run for over a year and the, it was basically the first weekend we met and uh, the topic was really... I as a leader, because it is, they were all leaders and they were all in leadership uh, positions. And, and it was really like the self-clarification and this, who am I as a leader? Mm. Uh, this was the topic on, on, on the first weekend. And of course, that's a lot of self-reflection and it's a lot of discussions on topics yeah. like leadership or, or others. Yeah. I'm Rain. I'm from Experiential Learning. We facilitate programs for executives and we use Session Lab because it's a very easy tool to design a meeting, easy to share with your colleagues and get a script for the meeting in no time without too much hassle. So visit sessionlab.com and find out more yourself. And somehow when I imagined the situation and this workshop, I thought of a leadership team of five VPs, for instance, doing this together in order to reflect about the shared responsibility of being leaders and how they can communicate without putting the responsibility onto the other's shoulders or taking the power by only asking questions. Well, that is certainly an interesting group to try that with. And the challenge with this approach would, of course, be the time, because I do not think that it oh, would yeah. work within a day mm -hmm. to get there. so I think you would, would need a little bit more time but that said the people that were there they were all experienced and they were all very very high in their normal jobs mm -hmm. they were in high positions so they were all they were all leaders and and I I just remember one feedback very clearly one participant came to me and said I really want to thank you because I've been been a leader for over 30 years mm -hmm. but I've never been given the space or be pushed to reflect in the way that I reflected the past three days. And that's a fascinating feedback. It's, yeah. it's, it's not a feedback for me. I think it's as much a feedback for this person. Mm -hmm. because the person took the time, took yeah. the chance and wasn't scared of maybe a journey that wasn't the most easy. So yeah. can you think of a mini version of this exercise that we could use in a normal workshop setting we would have to think about it i'm sure we could come up with something i mean the, the easiest is if for mini exercise it would also have to be around a topic mm -hmm. because you can just then go in completely blank so open space style but you would have to have a topic and then you could stimulate uh, by maybe making statements by letting people reflect in the beginning so i would have to we'd have to think put our heads together and come up with something but i have no doubt that we would if you put out to open up our toolboxes that we would mm -hmm. have wonderful opportunities to design something yeah maybe even just an introduction so participants to introduce each other or talk to each other without asking questions well you can make i mean my you you ask your participants to share their favorite exercises and mine goes a little bit into that direction mm -hmm. My favorite exercise is, is, and some might know it, is called Draw from Four Corners. Mm -hmm. So you basically put out flip charts on each table mm -hmm. uh, through a few um, pens, colorful uh, pencils or drawing equipment, could be chalks, nothing else on the tables. And then you ask the participants to sit down, each at one corner, 
So basically four per flip chart. And from that moment on, you say like no speaking aloud anymore. Mm -hmm. And then you basically just tell them draw. And then you watch that. And then silence. And they are invited to draw. It's fascinating what happens. So how many people per flip chart? Four, each each at one corner. And what usually happens is people start to scribble in their own corner. Mm Mm-hmm. Right? You start to draw what corner, whatever comes to mind. You can also even do that with, with topics, right? What you draw, what you think about leadership, mm-hmm. for example. But they draw in their corners and it almost always happens that one or the other person on the flip chart starts to invite others in. So they dare to draw a little bit in the other corner or they connect in the middle of the, the flip chart. And then slowly this becomes a, a common exercise where they draw a common mm. picture without being able to talk about it, without being able to, to discuss what they're actually drawing, but simply by observing, by, by reacting, by getting familiar with the other body languages. And it's incredibly interesting because you have so many layers you can reflect that exercise over. Yeah. So you can reflect it on your own behavior. Like when I did this the first time, I really had a, it was like holding up a mirror, like groups of people that I don't know. Yeah. It was really just like sitting back in the corner and observing what was happening before and, and, and not daring to draw anywhere else unless I'm, so I was invited in, right? Or um, others who, who immediately drew into other corners because they had a very different approach to this. Or you could reflect it over what did you actually draw? Mm. What did you think about? What went through your head? So I, I think there's a lot of, lot of layers and it's a connect exercise because I, I know you, you talked a lot about connection in your previous uh, workshop episodes. And this is an exercise that really brings you together. Yeah. It's very uncomfortable at one stage, but when you look at the result and the achievement and the, co- the co-creation of what you did at the end without having discussed it, it really, it, it does something with the people. So this is one of the favorite exercises that I that I love it. I will copy it with your permission and yeah. cite you. Awesome. I also please, I I copied it for you. (laughs) There's one challenge that I can see because it also reminds me of some improv exercises where you would have to to do something in silence. And there's always this one person who wants to take over control and kind of synchronize what's happening. And then goes, oh, what if we all draw in the middle something connected to leadership? How would you interfere? Do you think that the group does it itself? Or how do you go through such a process? We are very, very careful with our instructions. Mm -hmm. So we found a way, and I'm really, I have to say this, I'm so lucky to be able to work with people that share my... So we've really... we're very careful with our instructions in the sense of that we know exactly what and how we're saying it and when mm-hmm. we say what. So, so for example, in this case, the silence is already before they know the task. Uh. There's no way of preparing for the task. And mm-hmm. if somebody, and that also happens, of course, after. So, but I'm like, no, my instructions are complete. You won't get anything more from me if you mm-hmm. ask me now. And it's really this, this again, this, this slight stimulation to to really see that there's different interpretations of what the task actually is. You know, yeah. I mean, I, with my limited drawing skills, I drew houses and little cars, whatever I could draw, mm-hmm. while others artists, right, yeah. uh, on, on my flip chart. So when you look at it, you, you think like there's a very young child who drew that one corner and then you have these fantastic artists, right? But, mm-hmm. but still, the whole picture came to because I drew my little things also in other corners at the end. But I, I, I think it's it's... Um, you will always have people who, who will try to do that. And in some ways, I, I'm a big fan of that because mm-hmm. this magic moment to, to take a break after you've heard the task, think about how we can do it and then do it is, of course, when we work with teams, the key. Um, but in this case, the way you described it, it would probably be because people are insecure. So it's mm-hmm. a different motivation yeah. behind why they're doing it, right? Yeah, very interesting. How much time would you allocate for such an exercise? Including the reflection, 15 to 20 minutes. Because you will see, of course, the drawing, depending on if the people know each other or don't know each other, and you will always have some that, that will not buy in completely, which I, I never find a problem because it's beautiful to reflect. Mm-hmm. But the whole exercise, it's 
if you let them draw for yeah, six, seven minutes, depending, yeah. you see when they're ready, they're ready. You can even let them wait for a little bit if it, one table is ready, because maybe, you know, it's the same as with silence. They're mm-hmm. already silent, but already then they might just add more things because they see others still drawing. So it's really, it's a, it's a feel. And then the reflection probably, depending on how, how far you have come with the group, but the reflection can everything from being a hot debrief, just how was this? Or what we like to do is we let the, t- the, the teams first discuss uh, things that went through your head, feelings, mm-hmm. how was this for them? Then give the title, give the, the picture a title. Mm-hmm. And then do this, sharing this with the other groups. That's, that's how we usually like to do it. Yeah. I, I was asking because I think it's, again, it's a fine line. On the one hand, you want participants to build up this courage maybe also to draw and to use space to take space you want them to explore the boundaries and to what extent they can actually work together but you don't want maybe you want to push it a little bit further than you must just to explore the space of discomfort and silence when they actually are a little bit bored by the task (laughs) it's more often than not happens is that they start to laugh Mm. One, one point or the other and that's usually when they come together okay because because one drew into the other's corner and, mm. and then, then there's <laughs> an immediate connection like was this okay or not because there's always the moment like i draw into your corner and then there's always the moment where i stop was mm. this okay or was it not yeah and then you kind of you draw back and then there's a laughter and that does something with with, with the team and you know one group laughs and the other one is very serious about it but also this what's beautiful to watch because all of this is in a way uh, information for us as facilitators that's what i love about this job you you have the opportunity to see so many dynamics which you can use afterwards in reflections in in really in uh, thought provoking discussions and uh, in going a little bit deeper with the group and yes it's a completely fine line so i wouldn't do this exercise particularly long but it also doesn't take very long usually but what is fun about it you can use it as much at the beginning Mm. Or work when nobody knows each other, for example, or even people know each other, it doesn't matter. Or you can use it at the end, or you can use it just as a as an energizer. It really doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. You just have to reflect. You think about what you want to reflect over at the end. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering whether it can also be an analogy again to the organizational culture. So, to what extent do you stay in your own corner, or you dare to reach out, or you? connect the dots literally exactly and in, in the reflection you can lift it up on that did you see any parallels yeah. to your way of working to how how the culture in your organization is for example yeah we've spoken so much about different exercises and how to connect the groups and how to get this energy boiling what needs to happen for you to walk out of a workshop and say oh that wasn't good that failed <laughs> I think well this is a this is a very good question. I'm tempted to say that I don't think workshops fail. Um hmm. I think they seem like they seem unsuccessful maybe um but this always learn for me or if it's for the participants but what I've of course learned and I think that's uh, that, that always happens is the own ambition level. It's hmm. a big enemy of us facilitators because you said it before we we're, we're there for them. Mm -hmm. but we also want to take something away of course Mm -hmm. we want to succeed with the plan that we've had or we want the new exercise that we tried out and we hope last time this was amazing this time it didn't work so i always usually walk away from very energized from Mm -hmm. workshops but at the same time also very drained Mm -hmm. because my head works a lot during facilitations and trainings and that's because I want to capture the learning that's because I'm already redesigning because I I I think I redesign a workshop at least three times while I run it (laughs) and it's just a group that guides me Mm -hmm. right so I do walk out sometimes or or we because I really love to co-facilitate and we do that a lot so I, I I walk out and when I think it's it hasn't been successful is when I wasn't clear where I got the where I had the group at the end Mm. So when I'm not sure if, if, if they took away what they wanted to take away. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's, it's, we all 
have to fight expectations in a way because we are always compared to the previous workshop or to the best workshop or to the worst mm-hmm. workshop. And this is in a way not, not our fault, but the participants, when they sit in there and have their expectations, we will ultimately be compared. And if they walk out with the expectation of getting very concrete tools and you worked a lot on a cognitive level and mm-hmm. reflect it, it might be disappointment and you read it also. I hardly ever think we really failed, but I think like, yeah, maybe they didn't take away what they wanted. And mm-hmm. that is then a learning in like, what would, could what could have we or I had done differently mm-hmm. if, to give it to them, to present it to them, to be more close, to be more, to read, read them better. That starts mm-hmm. already in usually the pre-talks. It's a very important thing that they can clarify a lot, but every plan is only as long valid until you meet the group the first time. Or yeah. sometimes even for, when you see the room the evening before, I'm sure you've had that. It's like, oh no. Half of the exercises I've learned I can do in here, for example. Yeah. When you say pre-talk, with whom do you have these pre-talks? Well, you know, when clients come, it's, it's very often people that might either not be in the workshop mm-hmm. or might be in the workshop but only give their perspective. So I think it's it's important to um, to really make clear that we, we usually also factor in almost like a, a backup pre-talk when we start working with the group. So we usually do a needs something that goes along the lines of not, I, I, we don't like so much the whole, what are your expectations to the workshop, but it's more, why are you here? Mm-hmm. How do you want to walk out of this? And it's really just to get a feel like, what topics do you bring? Are those the same topics that we were told before? Mm-hmm. And we have learned, we've really learned that, and that is the beauty of, of, of how we work, that exercises you know, we all know these exercises that have the label like this is a perfect exercise for communication or this is a perfect exercise for a team thing. But we actually try to eliminate those labels because for us, it's a lot that ex- that these exercises are way more complicated more most of the time. So you can reflect it to a lot of topics. Mm-hmm. So mm. it works even if you have a plan and do a lot about how to, to have more mindful communication with each other, for example. And it turns out that that's absolutely not the topic here you might still be able to use the exercise to reflect it differently. Mm. And so there's, this is just, just something you have to trust. And I think we all, all facilitators have enough tools to, to be able to switch it out. It's just all about daring and saying like, well, okay, this isn't going as I, I want it, share vulnerability. It's like, yeah, let's take a little break and I'll think about how we can move on. Love the approach. It's very courageous. You need a lot of experience to approach a workshop with this kind of mindset. And just to make sure that I understood correctly, would that mean that you will surely redesign, as you said, the workshop a couple of times while it's running, but this might rather be in terms of how you use the exercises and how you reflect on them rather than using or coming up with totally different exercises? Both. Okay. More often it's really a, it's tweaking it's mm-hmm. cutting out things because you see the team is not quite there or that doesn't work for this team um or you switch around you see like well we planned this now but i i think the team actually needs something else now mm-hmm. um but it's usually i mean we all have our favorite exercises so they those you always have in the back end right and but what we really have learned is that playing with this vulnerability also and this uh, even like yeah okay you put me to a, you give me a test I I have to think a little bit about it give me a 15 minute break that helps and it's mm-hmm. also appreciated because if you play back to the team why you're doing something mm-hmm. and what was your thinking behind it yeah. it's usually often understood why you're for example planning to do because you can even say like and I've stopped exercises in the middle of it because I I see this is not working let's do something else and that was actually appreciated by them because they said like yeah it really wasn't working we would have done it but it wasn't working like, yeah, i saw that so why should we kind of work through let's move yeah. on and you could say it takes courage but at the same time i think it's once you've tried it a few times mm. you'll see that it's actually not so difficult and the response is more positive than anything else yes so. totally and i wonder there are two scenarios for this situation so as a facilitator in the middle of the exercise, you say, you know what, guys, I can feel it. It doesn't work. Let's do something else. Apologies happens to all of us. And then either the group reacts like, oh, wow, this person is really 
experienced because he or she senses that it's not working and has the courage or the character to take a decision. Or they say, oh, this is an amateur, doesn't even know, should have known, didn't prepare enough. How can you even dare? So according to you, what is the factor that makes a group react in one of the two ways? The factor is how you let the group know, mm -hmm. I would say, immediately. Because I, I think the latter option or the latter scenario that you presented is, in my experience, and I think we've all been there eventually, is more likely if you let it play out. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you offer through the exercise, so to say. Because it in a way is, is a bit like, yeah, we're not happy with you now anymore. But if you see them, if you pick them up and say like, well, you can even play it back and say like, do you want to continue? Because I, I have the feeling this is not working. Mm. We can continue or we can't. Because it's, it's really, I think this uh, letting go of the feeling you, we have to fix everything as facilitators. We have to decide everything and we have yeah. to know everything is a relief. And it's also really empowering because you get the group, you get the team in it and say like, listen, I just want to check with you. Are we okay? Because from the outside, it looks a bit like this is not working. Yeah. You can stop here or do you want to go on? And they often want to go on. So like, let's see where it goes. But you, you simply did that quick check-in mm. and, and whether they think of you, if you're professional or not doing that, I don't know, but they will certainly think of you as somebody who observes me picking them up where they are mm -hmm. and is not just trying an exercise and then doesn't care what happens yeah. on the other side. But it's more somebody that really, okay, I see you and I would just like to hear you if this is okay, what we're doing or not. And, not. and again, the other element I think to it is, is really explaining what happened. And mm -hmm. we've, we've done this often, you know, we, we all went over time where you basically had to say like, I'm really apologies for going over time and then explain what happened. Like saying like, well, it was really important to give you more time in this one reflection because we had the feeling that you needed this or wanted this. And that, of course, Im impacts the time plan. So make this explicit and zoom out and say like, this is, yeah. this is what I mean. Yeah. I wonder whether it's also just an instinctive reaction from the group. So if they see that the person is genuine and vulnerable, then they react by understanding in a kind of reciprocity way. Whereas when they feel blamed, then they will react in a counterattack. And then this blaming the facilitator is rather a defense mechanism because they feel blamed. So when you said that if the facilitator makes it about the group, oh, to let the group feel that they didn't get the exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it's easier for them to say, he doesn't make his job right. She no, exactly. I think this is this is important also to take the responsibility where it belongs because it's yeah. you are anyway blamed if the exercise mm. doesn't work. It's yeah, we, you didn't give good enough instructions, so it didn't fit, or it was mm. the exercise was stupid. Pardon my French, but it's it's fine. That's all of that. When you yeah. when when you really think about it, all of that gives you opportunities to ask the group that what's happening, what happened, yeah. And, yeah, and and there's not not more it takes very often. Yeah. And then it's an opportunity to connect on a different level yes, and to absolutely. give them ownership and to co-create, which can also be a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. How can you do that without asking a question? <laughs> Again, you start with an I message. Yeah. I feel that I, this is not going I, to work. This is not going to, too well. Mm. And then yeah. wait what they're going to do because they will take a decision just by their reaction. And it's just you sharpen because what you already did before, you sharpened other senses. Yeah. And not, not asking questions is sharpening other senses because yeah. you still want that connection. You still want the information. You still want to know where you have the other person. And questions are just simply maybe taking it away from you to first think what, you, what I actually perceive now. And yeah. by not asking the question immediately, I would have to say like, well, I have, yeah, I actually have the feeling this is working. So I would yeah. like to share that with you. Yeah. And then it becomes an invitation to share. And not just the permission to stop. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you so much. I learned tons. It was really nice talking to you. I always learned. I always learned. So I also learned in our talk now. It's fun to exchange experiences and perspectives. Absolutely.
if someone happened to fall asleep after minute one, just woke up and like, well, I don't have time to listen to the entire show again. What do you want them to take from this almost one hour conversation? I want them to take from this that it's completely okay not to have an answer to everything. And I think it's completely fine to try out new things because I don't think if we try out, new, I think if we don't try out new things, we won't, we won't learn. We won't mm -hmm. find new ways of doing things, new perspectives. And um, I guess be curious with our questions maybe. <laughs> But uh, yeah, try out things. Great. And if the listeners want to try out things with you and want to be guided by you and join a workshop without questions, um, or drawing corners, how can they reach you? Oh, yeah, they can reach us, uh, me and my, my fantastic uh, call and team, uh, www.groundwork.no. We're on LinkedIn, we're on Facebook, as everybody else these days, and uh, people can follow and, and see what we do there. And yeah, we'd be happy if somebody reaches out. And I will put everything in the show notes, and you facilitate in German and English and Norwegian as well? German, English, Norwegian. We're trying a little bit in French, but we're not there yet, I guess. <laughs> awesome. So I'm looking forward to keeping in touch. Yes. Thank you for the conversation. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Miriam. It was, a, it was great. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.org to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.